Today we're going to be looking at one of the most important questions uh, that concern the economy of Pakistan, which is understanding the agrarian structure of Pakistan. Now, if you don't know anything about the agrarian structure of Pakistan, you must have heard the view, the argument, that Pakistan is largely a feudal country. Whenever and wherever people sit together to discuss politics, it is often the case that they ascribe the worst aspects of the economy or the politics of Pakistan or the social culture of Pakistan to its feudal roots and to its feudal foundation. In fact, uh, if you pick up newspapers, uh, uh, you know, news, dawn, etc., English newspapers especially, you will see the argument repeated quite frequently. And even in culture, you can see the argument is quite prevalent. One of my favorite songs is uh, by Ali Gulpeer, which is Vadere Ka Beta. How many of you heard that? Okay, he's very popular, more popular than Lal, which makes me very jealous. But anyway, um, you know, sort of caricaturizing, caricaturizing uh, what feudalism is in the context of Sindh, etc. But it might surprise some of you to discover that uh, political economy, within the realm of political economy, this is actually quite a contentious issue, whether Pakistan is feudal or not. All right, so we're going to approach this question from a different angle uh, in the context of political economy. We're not going to approach it from the angle of examining culture. For, exa for instance, we're not going to begin by examining patriarchy. We're not going to begin by examining, uh, you know, um, music or literature or whatnot. But we want to look at, instead, what we want to look at is the, you know, is the actual structure of how people work together. So the first very interesting thing that you discover when you look at Pakistan is the dark area over here represents what is basically the agricultural area of Pakistan. It might surprise you or may not surprise you to discover, surprise me to discover that Punjab and Sindh together, this is really the Indus Valley, right? This is, this is the valley through which the Indus and all its associated rivers, this is where it flows through, right? I'm not just talking about the river, but the entire valley, right? So it might surprise you to discover that about 80% of the population of Pakistan lives in this particular dark area. 85% of the agricultural labor force lives over here. 85% of cultivated land is over here. 92% of irrigated uh, land and land areas over here. 88% of cropped area is here. 89% of the major crops and food grains are here. 79% of owners and 89% of, of the area owned, agricultural area owned, is basically in this valley. This region, the lighter region that you see, is extremely, extremely sparsely populated. Very, very few people here. So political parties might understand that if you dominate this valley through which all the rivers flow, you basically dominate Pakistan. This is where it's all, where the action is, to, so to speak, economically speaking. So um, the first interesting thing that we want to look at, we've already looked at this, but just briefly one, one more time, 1959 and 2002, land cultivation, what's going on with that, there isn't too much of a difference, if you, if you noticed. Forest area has maybe improved slightly, total cultivated area has gone up slightly, uh, area that is not available for cultivation remains pretty consistent at 42%. Cultivatable waste has gone down slightly, but overall the scenario remains pretty much the same. Now let's begin by examining first of all the kind of political economy, the kind of agrarian structure we had before the British arrived. That is, what was, pre what was agriculture like in the Mughal times in the pre-colonial era? The literature available on the subject both produced in India as well as outside of India, is divided along the lines of those people who consider that whatever the form of the economy that existed before the British came here, it was essentially very, very stagnant. It was an economy that could not demonstrate dynamism. And the, the um, uh, sort of the, the uh, conquest by the British introduced into the body politic of all of India, elements that may not have caused the rejuvenation of India immediately, or of South Asia immediately, 
but were the germs through which that rejuvenation could possibly occur. There is also a whole school of literature, of course, that justified the, uh, uh, the, the conquest of India, the British conquest of India, and said that the British were undertaking a civilizing mission. Most of that literature today is now rejected. Nobody, pretty much nobody, except for a few you know, sort of uh, cantankerous old uh, intellectual scholars may hold this view. But by and large, this view is now rejected as be essentially being literature that justified colonialism. So that's not what we're talking about. And on the other hand, you have the view that emanates mainly from India that had the British not uh, come into India and conquered India, that India would have been further ahead than it was today that not only did the British conquer India, but they actively underdeveloped India. So you see there's, there's this sort of dichotomy. Nobody today argues that colonialism was a good thing as such. Some do, but there are very few in number. But some do argue that colonialism introduced certain elements into Indian society that were very, very important for, its, for the rejuvenation of Indian society, whereas others think, None, no such elements were introduced, or if such elements were introduced, they, uh, on the scale of, uh, 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 you know, of history, they were rather negligible. And what is to say that India could not have introduced those elements on its own in those 200 years had, had colonialism not intervened? Whichever way you tend to look at that picture or, or that debate, the fact of colonialism remains unchanged. So what is more essential than speculating on what could have happened or would have happened if colonialism had not come about, what is perhaps more important is to understand what existed before and how it actually changed. What happened rather than speculating on what could have happened, ought to have happened, would have happened. So the kind of society, the kind of governance that you had immediately preceding the British was of course the Mughal Empire. In the Mughal Empire, we can go further back into history, but for the purposes of this course, we don't need to. The, the characteristic feature about the Mughal Empire was that land was not private property. Although this is also now debated. In social science literature, you can always find somebody or the other who will argue the other point of view. But by and large, scholars are agreed that as we understand propriety rights in the context of Europe, Similar propriety rights did not exist in the context of India. Land was not private property. It was ostensibly owned by the king, though not in the sense of being private property. And uh, the king granted permission to use the land uh, to his nobility, etc. The Mughal king had under him about 8,000 mansabdars. Mansabdars are not agriculturalists. They are fighters. They are warriors. They are soldiers. They are commanders of the army. The army under their command is obviously much larger than 8,000. To maintain the troops under the control of a particular mansabdar, like a subedar, etc., the mansabdar was given a certain amount of money from the treasury of the Mughal Empire. So if, he ha if they had you know, a couple of hundred soldiers, he would get uh, a certain amount of money in accordance to maintain those soldiers. Certain mansabdars, senior mansabdars, had under them horses and people, shasavars, people who could ride horses. In other words, a cavalry. A cavalry was something that was highly uh, prized by the Mughals, who, of course, uh, having come from their ancestors being in Central Asia uh, and part ancestors being, you know, sort of part Mongols, who were great horse riding people, built their empire on the foundation of their horse riding, essentially. So horse riding was a great prized art, a great, uh, horses were a great prized possession. And even today you can see in the context of Pakistan as well as in North India that to have a horse and to be a horse rider is considered to be something quite uh, elegant and beautiful and classy. So the cavalry commanders who had horses and had to take care of the horses and the riders obviously had expenses that were far greater than the infantry. So the cavalry commanders were called not mansabdars, but they were given a piece of land, an area from where the 
the, the, the surplus could be used to support the cavalry, to feed the horses, to support everything that was needed for the horses. So these were called Jagir Dars because they were given Jagirs. The Jagirs were given to them to basically take care of the army. So Jagir Dars are also were never agriculturalists. They are also basically army commanders. They did not engage in, they didn't know anything about Kheti Badi, nor did they live in the villages. They lived where the horses lived. And those were in the fortresses, whether that was Multan or whether that was Lahore or Delhi, whichever fort we are talking about. But the Jagirs were, of course, not inside Lahore, but maybe outside Lahore, maybe quite far away from Lahore even. Didn't matter. Because it was only at the end of the season that you went to, during the Katai season, etc., that you went to get the surplus. These Jagirdars, therefore, could, could and were often transferred from one Jagir to another every three or four years so that they could never consolidate their grip over that particular Jagir. So you're beginning to see here, I hope, that uh, this is a very different kind of system than uh, the systems that have existed in Europe, in my opinion. Under the Jagirdars were what is called the Zamidars. The Zamidars are based in the villages, unlike the Jagirdars who are not based in the villages. Today, when we think of a Jagirdar, we think of somebody with big muchas who's based in the village. But this is a different system, actually. The way in which the system has been changed brought the Jagirdar in name to the village. But the reality is different. So Zamidar, based in the village, his duty was to collect revenue on behalf of the Mughal emperor or behalf of the government. He is the Vadera. He presided over judicial matters and social matters. If anybody had a conflict in the village, they went to the Zamidar, to the Vaderas of the village. Again, the Zamidar also does not own the land. He is not a private property owner. Instead, his, he has no occupancy right. Instead, his task is to collect the rent and give it to the Jagirdar, taking a certain percentage for himself. Estimates vary, but you, you know, it's approximately 10%. Half of the produce of the village goes to the Jagirdar, 10% stays with the Zamidar. The rest is utilized by the people who work the land, the village, etc. Also, it's very important to know what, is, what are known as Khalisa land, which is basically state land, land that belongs directly to the state and from where the state is able to extract revenue without any intermediaries. So this is the Mughal system, the old political agrarian political economy. And whether the Mughals came in or came out or whether, you know, what the politics of the time were had no substantive impact on the way in which this surplus was shared or distributed in that particular system. Some unnis bees ka fark, you know, small differences, but no major structural differences as such. Yes? Uh, sir, just a clarification, did the Vatsadars, the Jagidars collect revenue or not? They collected it from the Zamidars. Okay. Yes, the Zamidars collected it from the peasantry. If we go back in time, and I'll tell you why I'm going further back in time, all the way to the Harappan civilization, Mohenjo Daro and Harappa, we are told that there, we don't really know, but scholars think that this was a civilization that was not based on the caste system. Um, this can be challenged, although the only way in which we can sort of figure out whether there was, whether these people practiced caste or not, is through the remains that they've left behind. They, and it's very difficult, obviously, to piece together the social structure of that society based only on architecture or on pottery and other things like that. But a lot of scholars are of the opinion, the majority of scholars are of the opinion, that the ancient Dravidian civilization did not practice the caste system. But the caste system has been very, very central to all of India, regardless of whether we are talking about the Vedic period, we are talking about the Mauryan Empire, we are talking about the Mughal Empire, whether we are talking about the slave dynasties, whatever period we are talking about, post the Indus Valley Civilization, the caste system comes to establish itself and becomes the foundation, of, in my view, of the political economy of South Asia. Why is this so important? We have tended to treat caste as a cultural phenomena alone. 
you know, ke uski zaat, ye uski zaat, wo wagaira, right? And we've often spoken against caste. But we have not really begun, in my opinion, to fully examine the caste system as an economic system, which is what it also was at the same time. It was a complete holistic system involving both economic aspects as well as cultural aspects. And although Muslims do not, you know, uh, in, in, in the Quran or whatever, there is no mention of the caste system. Uh, and uh, although they don't, you know, so there's no sort of religious justification for the caste system, the invasion by Muslims had no significant impact on the caste system. The caste system remained intact even after the Muslim conquest of India. So caste is actually a, period, uh, is a, na is a term that we have taken from uh, the Portuguese language because they used it, casta, and we're starting to use it. The, na the word that we ourselves have used is zat, ya jat. The Hindus say jat and we say zat. And uh, since Pakistan has been created, we don't like to use the word zat anymore. So we use another word, which is qom. And so the word qom is just the Islamicized version or Muslimized version of the word zat. In about a thousand years before Christ, which is the Vedic period, we see the development, the first development of the caste system. Uh, as every, every tribe was being inducted into this uh, new class society that was being built up after the Vedic period, three main conditions were imposed on people. The first was the veneration of the cow, uh, the acceptance of the caste system, and the last was the, uh, the domination of the Brahmins. If you accepted these three things, whatever other practices you may or may not have, it was absolutely fine. There was no contestation there. That's why when you go to India, you move from one village to another village, and the religion will completely transform. They will be, they will be worshipping some other deity, they will be worshipping some other, uh, you know, um, uh, form of uh, divinity, etc. As long as these, these three things remain in place, uh, it doesn't matter. You're moving forward. So what is caste and what is com? What does it mean? Caste uh, is caste only insofar as it is part of Hindu class society. If it is outside the pale of such a class society, it constitutes a tribe. So when it becomes part of this structure, that's when it becomes, when a tribe becomes part of this class structure, that's when it becomes a caste. As in the case of Aboriginal tribes still existing in India, Aboriginal tribes are basically the Adivasis. And the transformation of an Aboriginal tribe into a caste does not signify, as pointed out before, any internal changes in the tribe itself. It merely signifies it's being inducted as a unit member of Hindu class society. An induction which is symbolized by the acceptance of the leadership of the Brahmins, the great rationalizers and mystifiers of Hindu class society. Um, the caste as a system of caste is thus the expression of a class society. The classes of which in turn are composed of ingested but undigested tribal forms and whose position as members of the class society makes them castes. So whole tribes are, what's the word? Uh, ingested, taken in, but undigested in the sense that the internal structure of the tribe remains unchanged. Its religion remains unchanged as long as they accept those three main things. And then that tribe is given a specific role in society. You are the Kumars of society, you are the Lohars of society, the Sonars of society, you are the Zamidars, you are this, you are that, etc., etc. Whatever that role, occupational role will be, will then be, will then continue with that tribe throughout. So that's how specific tribes end up doing specific kinds of work, and that becomes their hereditary occupation from which they cannot escape. In Pakistan, castes can be divided, or qoms rather, can be divided. There are lots and lots of them. But you can have a supra category, dividing them into two main larger categories. The first is zamindar qoms, and the other is working qoms. Zamindar, and I'll use a word without meaning for it to be pejorative in any sense, the kammi qoms. Now, kammi comes from the word kam karna, which means to work. And we, have, we, of course, use this word even as a gali. And the gali signifies culturally that we regard work, 
to be somebody that labors as being something, something worthy only of rebuke and hatred. So, but actually the word literally just, etymologically just means worker, right? So, um, working, uh, so all right, so um, Zamidar Qom, what, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about the Sayyids, Avans, Rajputs, Gakhars, the Gujars, the Jat, the Arai, the Ron, the Malik, the Sheikh, the Bhatti, the Gondal and so on. Sheikhs is, uh, you know, also undertakes, uh, you know, sort of trade, etc. Kami Qoms include Chuda, Masalli, Sweeper. Musalli is another word, substituting this word here. We also use that word as a Gali. It's the name of a tribe that was given a certain work, sweeping and scavenging. Chamar, we also use this word in our Gali Galoch. It's basically somebody who works with leather. Nothing to be embarrassed or ashamed about. Today, when you have an Italian leather worker, you're like, oh, you're from Italy, so wonderful. When we have our own Italian workers, we think of them as being beneath us. Nai, you don't understand what that is. Chimba, Dhobi, Mirasi, which uh, a lot of people say I am, because I sing and play guitar. But <laughs> it's actually the village bard. Uh, Kasai, Kumar, Tarkhan, Badai, Lohar, Changar, Malla, Kevat, Teli, Kahar, Vagara, 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 Vagara. All of them, as you can see, are associated with the kind of work they do. What is the work they do? Take care. Um, in Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa, they also at one time used the word Nich Zat, Bad Nasal. Balochistan, they used the word Ghulam, literally, etc., etc. These working comms make up about a quarter of the population. They were largely composed of the great aboriginal elements of uh, South Asia. So the words that we use for people who work signifies what we think about work. It also tells you why Pakistanis love it when they get good grades or make lots of money without work, why they take very little pleasure in work. Because for thousands of years, work has been associated with slavery. So to not work is to mean that you are truly emancipated. We are culturally prone to think of it in that way. Because even the working um, castes, zats, are hierarchically placed in relation to each other. So it's not just that the zamindars and the kami castes are placed in hierarchy to each other, each of these castes is placed in a hierarchy to each other. Each of those castes is also placed in a hierarchy to each other. For example, the Sayyids are far above the Arai. Right? So a whole thing from top to bottom is a set of hierarchies on the basis of your tribe, your birth, etc. But also I want to point out one other thing. That the caste system was highly impervious to uh, social mobility. It was very, very restrictive and still is very, very restrictive of social mobility. And the method through which social mobility is stopped is, you tell me, what do you think is the method through which social mobility is stopped? Marrying in the same caste? Exactly. The first and most important barrier was that you could not marry across castes. And this continues to exist still today in Pakistan. If you go to any village and uh, you find out if... Uh, somebody from the lower caste can marry somebody from the upper caste, it will be a marriage in which the people will have to run away from the village, elope, the Badas, the Baderas will never give permission for something of that sort. And that's where the literature associated with Heer Ranja and uh, Mirza Sahiba and others, etc., Soni Mahiwal, etc., in each of those great, uh, uh, what's the right word, Saad? Epic Yes, epic stories. In each of those epic stories, the reason why the lovers cannot unite is always the caste system, the system of Biradri. And those stories are not so radical as to suggest that a lower class man would marry an upper, upper caste woman, uh, but just that they are marrying across, you know, Biradris, etc. Even that is not allowed. That is, you know, and all of them end, sadly, in tragedy. Yes. So one of the th things is that, uh, first of all, with the advent of Islam, a huge amounts of people who wanted to escape the caste system converted to Islam to escape the caste system. But 
And while uh, amongst those areas of India, the caste system is certainly weaker where Islam predominates, it still exists. And if you go to any village area, you will find an Islamic justification for the caste system. They'll even bring out an ayat for you uh, and say, this proves that God wanted the caste system to exist. I have seen it myself. And then the, in the second transformation, many of the people who were in the lowest castes and untouchable, etc., etc., wanted to escape their untouchability by converting to Christianity. And even though they converted to Christianity to escape untouchability, untouchability nonetheless followed them. And now it became that we can't have food with Christians, in the Punjab, for instance. We can't have food with Christians because they're of a different religion than us. But if a Gora Christian from England comes and says, uh, serve me some food, then they'll be ready to serve. There's no problem with respect to a Christian who comes from the West, but a Christian in Pakistan, uh, you know, Muslims will refuse to share food with them. Uh, and the real reason for that is actually the caste system. Now, before we go to capitalism, etc., um, you can understand from this system that uh, this is a system based on a, uh, on a kind of slavery of, the, of, of a huge percentage of the population, of the working people. And you can understand also it's based on a, uh, it's a very highly discriminatory towards these people. And I haven't brought in the element of purity and purity of blood and, and so on and so forth, which was central to the maintenance of the caste system. So you do not even share food with people from a lower caste. And if you're a Brahmin and their shadow touches you, then you have to go and bathe seven times or whatever. All these systems, and they have to get, collect water from a different well from you and so on and so forth. So there are a whole number of social attitudes that are present to enforce and maintain the caste system. Highly discriminatory. Um, so given that the political economy of India at the time was based on this structure, I tend towards the view that from within this structure, unless there was a revolt and the breakup of this structure, it is highly improbable that India could have uh, broken out of this system and emerged into a period of modernity. This system was incapable of modernizing and remains, even today, totally incapable of modernizing South Asia. Very archaic. With the development of capitalism, the whole caste system now begins to be transformed. At the very general level, relatively high castes metamorphosed into dominating capitalist classes, while the low castes metamorphosed, metamorphosed into wage laborers. However, certain castes were more suited to the new capitalist mode of production. In particular, trading castes rose in status above their former superiors. Trade and commerce in Pakistan today is dominated by five castes traditionally associated with trade, the Maimons, the Kojas, the Boras, the Chinyotis, and the Sagals. These are not the you know, Brahmin sort of caste. They are originally trading tribes, families, etc. These were the most, the, the, the castes that were best able to make the transition to capitalism were the ones that were dealing not with land but with trade, for obvious reasons. Uh, what is the relationship of caste and class? The specific economic relationship of given caste to the means of production is the class of that caste, in my view. This is my view. Others may disagree. Uh, Zat means thus born. And delineated clans and tribes, each zat, zati or zat had a specific role in the division of labor, which was hereditary. That hereditary role in the division of labor had a very specific social status that was maintained by detailed sets of root, rules. Endogamy, preparation of food was passed, part of it. And the village council would enforce these rules, uh, you know, and enforce this, this status on people. Um, and many, uh, you know, zats today are still named after the traditional occupations. So, for example... You know the guy who sang Jugni. What is his name? Arif Lohar. So what do you guess is his traditional occupation? Lohar, which is why he has the chimta, which is made of? You guessed it. Um, so, um, uh, um, so anyway, I, I, let's, uh, I think you understood enough of what's going on over here. And you know enough about the system to be able to piece things together. So this is what existed before. Now, how does this relate to the question of feudalism? What is feudalism exactly? I can play this. I'd like to play this short video because uh, I think he did a very good job in very quickly explaining what feudalism is.
So the feudal system developed in medieval Europe after the fall of Rome. Of course, this is a word that can sometimes be applied to medieval Japan as well. And what's important to note right here at first is it's a word that no one used at the time. Feudalism is a term that is made up by historians in order to explain this system of political organization during the Middle Ages. How do we come up with a word to explain it? So at the time, if you would have asked someone what is feudalism, they wouldn't have been able to tell you, but we can tell you now, and that's what I'm going to do. So after the fall of Rome in 476, and even coming up on the fall of Rome, where the barbarian tribes are gaining the upper hand, Europe developed into a much more rural society because people vacated these cities that were becoming dilapidated and crime-ridden, and they were going to rural areas. Also, this network of roads that the Romans were so famous for maintaining began to fall apart, and trade collapsed as well. So most people in the centuries following the fall of Rome lived on medieval manors. Okay, a manor is a largely self-sufficient community that's governed by a lord who protects the people, administers justice, and of course profits from their labor. Here is a manor house. Not everybody got to live there. Okay, most people lived in much more modest dwellings. And the people at the very bottom of the medieval totem pole were the serfs. These were agricultural laborers who were tied to the land they couldn't leave. In a lot of ways, similar to slavery, but not quite. Now, not every medieval peasant was a serf, but serfdom was very prevalent in a lot of medieval societies. So when we talk about feudalism, we're talking about a network of independent communities like this that are tied together by a weak central authority because central authority wasn't really going to work in this society that didn't have a lot of roads, a lot of cities, a lot of trade. And let's think about a chessboard, okay? Because when we're playing chess, anybody who's played before, you don't have to be Kasparov or somebody like that to know that the king is not a very powerful piece. The king is dependent on the support of powerful and nominally subordinate allies, the knights, the bishop who represents the church, the rook who represents the nobility, and of course the peasantry in the form of the pawns. But the king counted on a lot of support in order to keep everything together. This wasn't really like a nation the way we think of it today, much more of a patchwork quilt. And you can see that quilt format here in this map of feudal France in the 15th century, okay? Some people miss France. Maybe some people don't. Maybe some of you have never been there. But when we look at this, we see the king's personal dominions around Paris, but then we also see the Duchy of Burgundy, the Duchy of Brittany, the Kingdom of Navarre, which of course will produce the Bourbon dynasty later on. So all of these different lords are swearing oaths to this king, but the king really doesn't exercise a lot of control over this quilt that was feudal France. So the whole feudal system revolved around a feudal contract where the Lord gave a grant of land known as a fief. That's part of where we get the word feudalism is from this word fief. Now, he gets this grant of land that nominally belongs to the king, but the vassal really controls it for all practical purposes. And in return, the vassal gives loyalty, typically in the form of military service, but that could also be in the form of taxation, which is going to be more prevalent in the late Middle Ages. Now note here, I've got a lot of L's here. Lord, land, loyalty. So when you're thinking about the feudal contract, think on one side land and on the other side loyalty as a good starting point. When we look at the feudal hierarchy, of course, we see the king at the very top. Now, the king, this is the only person that is not a vassal to anyone, that is not in the state of vassalage, that is not swearing an oath. Now, of course, there were English kings who had lands in France that swore an oath to the French kings, but then, of course, they attacked them. But typically, the king is not a vassal. The great lords, these are people who swear an oath of vassalage directly to the king, and then they, in turn, have their own vassals. 
the lesser lords, who then maintain knights. Now, the knights are not nobles, but they still have land. So let's consider the nobility is made up of the great lords and the lesser lords. The knights, of course, are people with means, but they are not nobility. And then, of course, at the bottom, you have the peasantry. So on one hand, you see the grant of land and legal privileges, even for the peasants, the privilege to use the Lord's oven or just the privilege of protection and simply breathing air, okay? And then on the other side, you had loyalty, which could be manifested in terms of military service, dues, or work obligations. Okay, so I think you get the picture broadly of what feudalism is. Um, if we look at um, what the text that I, uh, what, that I gave you is Pakistan feudal. When we look at that, we see that there's a debate about the exact definition of feudalism. Um, while the period is not under contestation, although some people begin, it, begin, in, begin this period from the 9th century, others will begin it from the 5th century, still others will begin it from the 10th, 11th century, etc. But broadly, it's the medieval period that we are talking about. Um, and while the system of vassalage is also not sort of uh, contested, what is perhaps contested is the idea of uh, how central to the definition of feudalism serfdom is. For Marxists, for example, that is absolutely the most important thing in the relationship that defines that mode of production that any mode of production that exists without, surplus, without serfdom cannot be cat categorized as feudalism, just as any mode of production that exists without wage labor for Marxists cannot be categorized as capitalism. But Hamza Alvi gives his own definition of feudalism in the text, which has been very, very popular among South, Asians, uh, South Asian scholars, Pakistanis and Indians. He says that it's an economy with five different characteristics. Unfree labor, whatever that form of unfreedom may be. Extra economic coercion, that is work is gotten out of people by you know, using violence. Fusion of economic and political power. So the feudal lord is, a, is both a, a juridical authority as well as an economic authority. A subsistence economy that de depends on simple reproduction. In other words, there's no growth taking place over here. Simple reproduction means that you can continue to produce the same amount of commodities, goods, and services that you produced before. They're not actually commodities, goods, or services, but you continue to produce the same amount of produce as you produced before. So we can go with any of those definitions. I personally like the one about serfdom. So serfdom is one kind of unfree labor, a specific kind of unfree labor. <coughs> Um, slavery is another kind of unfree labor. Caste system, in my view, is another kind of unfree labor that is not serfdom. So the question really is, if this is what feudalism is, if feudalism is, if feudalism is essentially based on serfdom, then can we first and foremost even consider the Indian Mughal system as being feudal? Is it really the same as European feudalism? if you ask my opinion, and you don't have to accept it, but I think that the, that the way in which India was structured is quite different from the way in which medieval Europe was structured. Mughal India has a very different political economy to medieval Europe. And the one biggest difference between the two of them is that whereas surplus is extracted through a system of serfdom, let's say, in medieval Europe, surplus is extracted through the caste system in the context of South Asia. If we think of both of them as being feudal, we miss out this very distinctive feature of India, the caste system as being at the heart of the political economy of pre-capitalist or pre-colonial India. So what is the impact of colonialism? Building on what you said, the first and most important aspect that the British authorities introduced into, introduced into the political economy of South Asia is private ownership of land. This is huge. It changes the way in which villages operate, function, and so on. They also introduce, obviously, a legal system which will uh, uh, reinforce that private ownership of land and a form of government, including taxes, etc., that is tailored to that 
private ownership of land. So when is private property introduced? It's introduced first with the Permanent Settlement Act in 1793. That's the Bengal Permanent Settlement Act. By the time they get to Punjab, the Permanent Settlement Act in Punjab is in 1860, a hundred years later. So the power of the landlord or the peasant was dissolved and was reconstituted in the form of bourgeois landed property, says Hamza Alvi. When the Permanent Settlement Act was created, the old system was destroyed, he says. Um, the other kind of system that they introduced was the Ryotwari system, where the state owned the land and the state would then give it to peasants to cultivate. So two forms of systems here that we see. The state will give the land to the zamidar or will give the land to the jagirdar. The zameen will become the private property of the zamidar or the jagirdar. We've heard this occur in the context of Pakistan. We of, you know, during the 70s, it was very common for people to say that the jagirdars of Pakistan became jagirdars because they got the jagirs from the British. The British awarded the class that was loyal to them and gave them big land grants, etc., etc. And on the other hand, you have the Ryotwari system, which is basically you have these state lands on which you have lots and lots of tenant farmers. So Cornwallis was the one who introduced it first and foremost. The old system based on castes, uh, caste, etc., is now undergoes a transformation. And the new division, the main new division, is based on ownership of land. Who owns the land? becomes the most important question after the Permanent Settlement Act. So at the top of the, of the pyramid, of course, are what you would call landlords. These came mainly from the Zamidar or from the Jagirdar class, uh, the Sayyids, the Rajputs, the Jats, etc., etc., uh, and then so on. Below them came the what broadly we could call the peasant proprietors. Peasant proprietors are a, is a broad category. It includes lots of different people, rich peasants, middle peasants and poor peasants. But they be, typically, they own the land that they themselves cultivate. A landlord generally is not going to cultivate his own land with his own hands, etc. A landlord will have own land, but will give that land to be cultivated by sharecroppers. Whereas a peasant proprietor is somebody that cultivates their own land. So what are the peasant proprietors? First of all, we have rich peasants. Rich peasants are peasants who work their own land but they may have enough land, enough resources to also hire other people to labor the land with them. So they work their own land, but they also have workers working alongside them. Second comes the category of middle peasants. Middle peasants typically will have enough land that their own family, etc., and the labor of their own family will typically be enough to, uh, to, to, to run the land, etc. They may hire other workers, or may even hire themselves out, but on average, they have just about enough land that they make their own ends meet, and that's it. They typically will not give their services out to other people to, uh, to rent, and neither will they take workers in. Last category is poor peasants who, have tip, who have, don't have enough land such, or enough resources such that they can survive without also hiring out their labor to other people. So they may have a small plot of land, like five acres, or two, two acres, or four acres, or six acres, or whatever. Generally speaking, five acres is not enough land for a family of workers to sustain itself. These people are what you will call, not, they're not technically landless, but they're effectively landless. They actually have land, but the land is not large enough for them, really, to survive with just that. So those are the, that's the poor peasantry. And under the poor peasantry, you have the landless sharecropper, the poorest of the poor. Two-thirds to 80 percent of, two-thirds to 70 percent of poverty is in this class. This is the poorest of the poor of all of South Asia. Uh, so they don't have any land, they live in the villages, and they have to hire out their services casually or permanently or seasonally in order to survive. If you want to look at poverty statistics, poverty data, Demographically, who are the poorest of the poor in Pakistan? It's this class of people. If you want to do poverty alleviation programs, this is the class of people, the landless, <coughs> living in rural areas, that you have to get to in order to lift people out of poverty. Agricultural wage workers, of course, uh, are typically people who, will, who work for a wage. They may work <coughs> permanently on a particular farm, or they may work seasonally or casually. The second major transformation that the British introduced is the monetary tax. They are not only collecting taxes, they are collecting it in money terms. The Mughals also were collecting it in money terms towards the, 
just before the British came in, etc. But now, given that taxes and very high taxes have to be paid in the currency, uh, you know, in the uh, in, in the in the uh, British Indian rupee, etc., peasants have to now produce for the market to earn the cash to pay the taxes. So this introduces cash cropping. You're making you have to sell your crop into the market to earn the cash to pay the taxes. And this breaks the self-sufficiency of the village because you have to go to the market now. You can't just you know, produce in the village and live off the land. And this results, Zaidi says, in the expansion of cotton and wheat, the production of, uh, of cotton and wheat. It also leads to the commercialization of land. Uh, land becomes now, since land is private property, land can be bought and sold. So whoever goes under debt cannot pay back the, the loans. What do they do? They sell the land. And when they sell the land, often the land went to people who were not necessarily agriculturalists. In fact, in the 1870s, 1880s, 90s, etc., the, the mortgaging and sale of land went to such a high proportion that the British had to introduce new laws to sort of protect the peasant proprietor. Uh, first of all, they introduced a law that only cultivated lands will be subject to tax. Then in 1900, they introduced a very important law called the Punjab Land Alienation Act, under which they sa said that land could not be sold to those castes that, would not, that were not agrarian castes. It could not be sold to the Banyas or to the Sheikhs, etc., etc., to the Tajir folks. It could not be sold to people who would not cultivate the land. So, and last, uh, the, the British began to reduce in Punjab canal colonies. It cannot be, un I cannot understress how different Punjab becomes and parts of Sindh become because of the canal colonies introduced by the British in comparison to other parts of India. In the early 20th century, for example, less than half the entire irrigated area was watered from canals. Within a period of two decades, canals watered 80% of irrigated land in the Punjab. This is a seven-fold increase in the first half of the 20th century, just two decades. And here you had tenants, etc., who were given, who were settled in these communities now. And uh, in 1912, the British even gave them the right to say, okay, you are Morusi Mazaras. In other words, we will give you, in time, we will also give transfer to you ownership of the land. Typically, 10 to 15 acres, uh, they used to create a lot of 10 to 15 acres and give that to a family to, to, to tend to. A kamdar, which is kamdar, kamdar is basically an overseer. Hissa betai is the term used, which is a very important term to understand these terms. It's 50 generally 50% of the share, although sometimes there were regulations enforced to try and lower it. But that means half of the produce has to be given to the landlord. So if I take something you know, on tenancy relations, what I produce out of that, I give half to the person who owns the land. That's hisab batai. Uh, the hari and the mazara are basically two different words used. Hari used in Sindh, mazara used in the context of Punjab. Basically, that's a tenant. Um, Morusi mazara, Morusi hari is somebody who has some certain occupancy rights. Occupancy rights means the right to occupy the land, to live there. The, one of the big things about uh, Mazaras is, of course, ejectment, throwing them off the land or keeping them on the land. So um, sometimes the state, etc., was interested, or the landlord may be interested in moving around where the tenancy is given to a particular Mazara so that they never solidify themselves in a particular area. So is Pakistan feudal? What is the answer that scholars, what, is, what does the literature say? Well, there's some people who say absolutely. Imran Ali, who also is, uh, was, uh, you know, here at LUMS, Dr. Imran Ali uh, taught for many years, I think he was dean of one of the schools, etc., I forget which one, uh, says, and wrote this very important book, which is one of the sort of major books on the political economy of canal irrigation and, uh, and Punjab, um, the political economy of Punjab, says, agriculture did not experience any major transition from traditional modes. Capitalist forms of agriculture did not emerge on any significant scale as a consequence of the reforms introduced by the British. Mahmoud Hassan Khan, he is, also, he is considered the sort of uh, scholar of agrarian political economy in, in the context of Pakistan. I mean, he's written uh, uh, about it, researched it for decades on end, and anybody who begins, begins by studying Mahmoud Hassan Khan. The fusion of feudal rural society and British administration decisively eliminated the chances for positive change in India. This system reinforced feudal relations on land. 
So very, very important big name saying feudalism was reinforced by the British rather than undermined. On the other hand, people like Akbar Zaidi, he says, no, in fact, it's not being reinforced, but the other thing is happening. Private property in land, emergence of a land market, commodity production, cash cropping, the, you know, the explosion of the quantity of crops produced, export of crops, monetary land taxes, the new legal system, uh, the fact that uh, political and uh, economic power is no longer fused, gets broken, new sources of credit are introduced, agricultural credit, etc. Polarization of classes takes place, uh, wage labor comes about, etc. The isolated village community is now connected with a network of roads, etc. All of this shows the integration of town and country and the development of small manufacturing, even in, ag even in rural areas. All of these point towards the fact that, in fact, Pakistani agriculture is more capitalist than feudal. What does this show, what does this graph show between 1960 and 2002? What it shows is that wheat, sugarcane, cotton, and rice account for more than 75% of total crop output. And the percentage of land being utilized for wheat, sugarcane, cotton, and rice is growing. These are cash crops. That would sig signal that this is commercial agriculture, not the old feudal agriculture. What does the distribution of GDP show? You've seen this graph before. It shows that agriculture, in terms of what it's contributing to GDP, is now not the largest segment. In fact, everything else is much larger. Is Pakistan feudal, well, given that agriculture is not the dominating section of the economy anymore? It used to be. It's not anymore. In terms of labor force, it has, yes, still has a lot of influence. But even here, you can see that the tendency is definitely towards labor moving out of agriculture and into other enterprises. What's happening typically with tenant farming, which is associated conventionally with feudalism? Is it on the rise or is it on the decline? This is owner come tenant farming. This is owner farming. Yani ke, I own the land that I'm farming. Tenant farming is when that land is given out to other muzaras, muzarat ka nizam. What is happening with that? Well, it seems to be that tenant farming is in fact declining. Owner farming is increasing. Another signal that the traditional way of mazarat is going down. There may even be an argument, there is also an argument made that muzarat, tenant farming, in the form that it took under the British, cannot be considered feudalism itself. Because now you're engaging in this sort of commercial farming, etc. But even if you were to concede that tenant farming is feudalism, you can see that it is dramatically declining. What's all happening to land holding patterns? This is the Gini coefficient of land, equality, uh, land inequality. The higher the Gini coefficient, obviously, that means the higher, the greater land inequality is. Cultivated land, irrigated land is blue and red, respectively. What's happening? 1960 land inequality has a Gini coefficient of 0 0.6. It declines dramatically in 1972. And the reason we all know is that Bhut is Bhutto's land reforms. Now, actually, the decline in land inequality is not a consequence of the land reforms, but is a consequence of the effort of landlords to evade Bhutto's land reforms. So they undertake, uh, you know, uh, they, they change all their kagazat, they change all, you know, they change uh, whose name the property is in in order to evade land reform, which changes the way in which this uh, statistic is com computed. The actual class inequality, you will see in the next class, does not actually uh, undergo such a dramatic transformation as seems to be, uh, as indicated by this graph. But what is the trajectory? The trajectory is towards greater inequality, which means greater class polarization. Now, what we know about capitalism is that capitalism the way it works is that it generates class polarization. Whereas feudalism or the other caste system, it has inequality, but it's a very stable kind of inequality. It's the kind of inequality that jaddi pushti remains the same, right? Uh, there isn't this bifurcation, polarization of inequality, which is also why those systems were, relatively speaking, more socially stable. They didn't cause too much class trouble because 
because the way the system was structured continued for many, many years. The other major reading that I gave you, I think the mathematics may have intimidated you if you bothered to read it. Uh, but uh, don't worry about that. Uh, um, Sir Faraz Anwar looks at inequality and uh, across various indices. Uh, if fat cat and I cat, uh, there's a fat cat with an I cat, but uh, you know, uh, the, the, these acronyms may confuse you, but all it means is farm area, total farm area, uh, cultivated, fa fa cultivated farm area total, and irrigated cultivated area total. And then of course you have the, you have the numbers for total inequality, between province inequality and within province inequality. So this is total inequality, between province inequality, within province inequality, and then within province inequality divided by total inequality, right? So the numbers here, if you look at the numbers, you'll see the same trend that I showed you earlier. All of these numbers decline and then incline, decline and then incline, decline and then incline. Uh, so we don't have to go through all the individual numbers, but if you graph it, it's much easier to see the trend. We're more interested with these sort of numbers, it's always better to look at the trend than to look at the exact number. Because the way in which this data is put together is so aggregate and so open to so many inaccuracies that in fact the exact number is less important, in my view, than the trend. And you see the same trend. 60 goes down, then goes back up. Goes down, goes back up. Goes down, goes back up, and so on, right? It's indicating over and over again that the land reforms of Bhutto forced people to change their papers, etc., but also indicating that citrus paribus, you take out the impact on land registration of Bhutto's land reforms, the result is that land inequality is growing. As, what would that indicate? According to Zaidi and others, it would indicate that agriculture is already dominated by market, commercial agriculture, market economies, i.e. capitalism, not feudalism. Right, so wage labor in agriculture. Wage labor is the most important element of capitalism. Marx in Das Capital says that capitalism definitionally is wage labor, nothing other than wage labor. So what's happening with wage labor? Well, when you look at permanent wage labor, that actually shows a trend, a declining trend. It shows that people are not keeping permanent wage laborers. That is, I keep somebody on a salary, they work for me throughout the year. But when you look at casual wage labor, you see that in fact it is on an incline. And in fact, uh, more or less sort of evens out between 40 and 50%. Uh, data today is also about half, 50% or whatnot of casual labor. So casual labor is basically seasonal labor. What does that mean? Okay, when, I need to, when I need to cut the crop, when I need to sow the crop, when I need to do something, I am going to hire laborers to do that seasonally. So seasonally I get laborers to do that work and then they leave and I get my permanent employees to take care of the farm in between. So again, this, what does this show? The growth of wage labor, certainly from 1972, which is only a 30% casual wage, all the way up to 50%, that's a huge jump. Absolutely statistically significant. 20% jump is uh, millions and millions of people shifting occupations, moving into casual wage labor. So what do various scholars now say? Well, um, Mr. Belo Kranitsky over here says that in 1880s, land markets already emerged. In 1860, we had the land tax in cash. In the mid-1860s, we had courts of civil justice. In 1880s, we had the export of commodities. Hence, he concludes, agriculture has already been transformed by the British back in the 19th century into commercial capitalist agriculture. McEachern says the fact that surplus extracted from agriculture was not reinvested in India is not evidence of feudalism because the surplus was transferred to Britain. So many people have made the argument. Uh, you can also refer to the debate in India. The, this whole debate that we're having in Pakistan has actually also occurred in India. It's called the mode of production debate in India. Most of it occurs on the pages of Economic and Political Weekly, Utsa Patnaik and others, etc., writing on it, etc. So one argument that emerged from that is that the surplus was not reinvested into technology, it was not reinvested into anything useful, hence this, is, this was still feudalism. But he says the surplus was reinvested, just not in India, it was reinvested in Britain, into something useful. In fact, that was the basis of Irfan Habib and others saying 
that the Bengal, the conquest of Bengal is very central, one of the central things to the uh, industrial revolution of the 18th century. What does Hamza Alvi say? He says, what we have in col colonized India, therefore, is a capitalist mode of production, but a capitalist mode of production that has a specifically colonial structure. One thing is clear. The feudal mode of production was dissolved and there is no basis on which we can justify designation of the relations of production in agriculture that resulted from the colonial transformation any more as feudal. So very clearly he's standing on that side saying feudalism is finished. Zaidi also says the same thing. The trend and process was one conclusively of moving away from feudalism and dissolving pre-capitalist forms of production. He uses pre-capitalist rather than feudal keeping it open, okay, what kind of pre-capitalist relations with they were, and replacing them with capitalist forms. So, popular perceptions are that Pakistan has feudal attitudes. What are these feudal attitudes? Uh, Tahmina Durrani's famous book, My Feudal Lord, you know, uh, played a big role in sort of creating for us what a typical feudal attitude or what a feudal lord, typical feudal lord is or isn't. But from the point of view of political economy, feudalism is first and foremost an economic system, not cultural values. Cultural values may emerge from that economic system, but similar cultural values may emerge from other economic systems, etc. This is a complex terrain. Culture is a complex terrain. To identify feudalism with one specific culture may not be such a, may not be a, it may be much more complex than we think. But to understand feudalism as, economy, as an economy is a relatively more simple process. So does feudalism exist as an economic system in Pakistan? Today, agricultural produce, 80% of agricultural produce goes into the market. <coughs> Only 20% is kept for self-consumption. Can we consider this feudalism? You heard the definition previously where the manor was self-sufficient, you know, but now all of the, nearly 80% of what is produced in a village is marketed. Size of ownership does not determine feudalism. Just because I have a lot of land doesn't mean I'm a feudal lord. Because Monsanto, Cargill are two gigantic multinational corporations that not only operate in Pakistan but operate all over the world. And they are landowners on a scale you cannot imagine. Yet nobody would be silly enough to say that they are feudal lords. They are capitalist corporations. They, they are agribusinesses, right? So size of land ownership, he says, is not what feudalism is. Yes. Although feudals obviously have lots of land, but that alone is not a sufficient condition for us to say that someone is or isn't a feudal. Yes. All right, so wage labor has emerged. Size of holdings have fallen. Sharecropping has declined. 50 to 60% of people anyway don't live in villages anymore. In Punjab, 70% of people live in urban areas, etc. How can Pakistan be feudal given all these transformations? Exploitation, he says, is not the sole trait of feudalism. There can be exploitation in other systems too, right? Other systems as a whole can also be exploitative. So just because there's exploitation in the village doesn't mean that it must be feudalism because the two things are not equal to each other. Wilder, this is Andrew Wilder, shows that uh, in fact in, uh, this is a lovely book, it's on my bookshelf, I should have brought it today, I forgot. He shows that in fact if you study voting patterns in Pakistan's 70 year history, you discover that voting is ideological. It's class based, he says. Poor people are more likely to vote, have historically voted for people's party. And uh, traders, middle class people, upper middle class people have voted for PMLN or what was then PML, now PMLN. So he says it's actually there's a class division as far as voting is concerned. Today the situation may not be the same because today the People's Party has become much more of a party that uh, has, has been eliminated from the Punjab. But when, but you know, People's Party started from the Punjab. It didn't start from Sindh. This may be news to some people. It started from the Punjab. And in the Punjab, it was always the poor that would vote for the PPP. Uh, and PPP was basically a Punjabi and Sindhi party. It was never around in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or in uh, Balochistan. So we may also say, look, we have an elite that's like a mafia, right? A kleptocracy, corrupt politicians, etc. This is feudalism. 
But if you ever look at post-Soviet societies, you look at uh, the emergence of these mafias in post-Soviet societies, you have mafias there as well. But you have the biggest mafia, the name mafia comes from Italy. Nobody can say Italy is futile. It's, as capital, it's one of the most advanced capitalist societies in Europe, right? So, Zaidi says, blaming everything on feudalism takes the easy, it's, it's the easy way out. Um, and, this, and it's the incorrect path. We've got to look at things. What he's really inviting you to do is to look at things in more detail and understand what they are rather than just saying, you know, the whole problem is feudalism. That's the whole problem. And end the story. We've got to get into the nitty gritty. And I understand why, you know, we, 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 we can be very happy with the solution that it's, a, it's an intellectually lazy solution to say, Everything that's wrong with Pakistan is feudalism. And really, it requires a lot more work to work out, you know, well, what really is the cause for honor killing? What, what is the, you know, history structure behind it? What can we do to fix it? It requires a lot more work to work through that problem. And it requires a lot less intellectual work to just say, it's feudalism. End of story. So really, I think his, his emphasis is an invitation to us to look more deeply at, at the kind of economic structure we have created, understand it more thoroughly in a more nuanced way, and then to be able to create, find solutions to the problems that exist in Pakistan.